Hello. Hey, how are you? I am good. How are you? I'm fantastic. We need to get together to talk about, um, is that next week? Yes, next Thursday. So I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be in and out a bit this next week. So tomorrow I'm actually airplane 7.30 a.m. So got an early wake up time of about 4 a.m. But I will have, I think you have my cell phone, right, Risa? I'm not sure. Um, when not, I can I can message you on LinkedIn with my phone number afterwards for us to kind of touch base whenever I'm out of town. I'm like maybe um, Friday afternoon if that works for you. Um, later <laughs> afternoon maybe we're going to be. I'm getting the, to the conference about a day early, but we've got conference agenda all Friday, all Saturday, and about half a day on Sunday. <laughs> so we'll just have to honestly kind of message and I'll figure figure out the time and stuff. So. Hey, well, um, I just don't want to leave you hanging. Okay. So I will actually be, I'll, I'll be in town that day. Like I'm planning on uh, coming in from Lafayette. I'll probably be working from Baton Rouge that Thursday too. And Shala is actually setting up a lot of the different things like the food and stuff like that too. But we'll we'll talk about the speed work networking and all of that a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to um come by and, and we can meet in person, that that'd be fine too. Okay. We will we will figure it out. I think I have to be there. Like I'm trying to keep track of myself because I know even I get back late Sunday work from Lafayette Monday, but I think I have to be in Baton Rouge the Tuesday for a meeting. And then I know I'll be coming back in on that Thursday. So, so we will pick it all out. Let me do that. Tanya. Yes. Hi, Tanya. How are you? Hi, Albert. I'm good. How are you? Good. So I missed out on that crawfish bowl, didn't I? Crawfish bowl? Oh, you're talking about the okay. <laughs> All right. I know you missed the 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 volunteer day that PMI yeah, sponsored, but I did. yeah, the Good Friday crawfish boil that I had. Oh man, it looked good. <laughs> Looked like you knew what you were doing, Tanya. <laughs> it it came out it came out really good. Yeah, I did a good job on the veggies. I actually wasn't in charge of the crawfish per se. I just was taking pictures of that, but I got put in charge of like the Brussels sprouts and the garlic and all of that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, Yummy. <laughs> yeah, it came out good. I'm a uh, I don't know, somebody needs to remind me when does crawfish season end in Louisiana? Is it May or June? I cannot remember to save my life. Uh, that's a good question. I don't pay attention to that, honestly. It's my girls and my wife that buy it and bring me into work in it. <laughs> okay. I know it's soon, but it's it's like I always mark it as, as Easter. It's almost like every good Friday we we'll wind oh up. My God. It, but I was I in the Lafayette. I was in the Lafayette Delcom care uh, area, and I can tell you this almost every other house had a crawfish boil for Easter. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's absolutely what we do. <laughs> so <laughs> I figured it's probably big in Baton Rouge too, but I think it might be, I think it might be even more of a thing in Lafayette just because of like the swamps nearby. And I I actually know people now that go out on their boats and go crawfish. And so they'll see my kayak pictures and they're like, okay, we need to bring you in an actual boat where you can get closer <laughs> to the alligators than what you can in your kayak and not die. And you know, show you the crawfish traps and stuff. Oh hey, alligators are not my friend. I see them at, um, they have them at Avery Island. So it's like, I'll go out to Avery Island where, you know, Jungle Gardens, Tabasco, all of that kind of stuff. I'll see them out there, but they're, they're smaller. And I've seen them in Lake Fossey Point when I'm in the kayak. I've seen them in Henderson one time. Okay. I haven't seen them in Lake Martin, but I know that that's where the big ones live. I just... I haven't happened to to get out on that side when I'm in the kayak, which is probably a good thing. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tanya, I kayaked in Lake Martin for the last time like a year ago when I was surrounded by alligators bigger than my kayak. I was like, oh, hell no, I'm out. 
I remember you and I talking about this at one point because I think you had seen those pictures from a while back that I put out there. We we wound up talking about the alligators. And that particular trip, I didn't see alligators, but I decided that it would be really cute to float off in the moss and the swamp trees to get pictures. But what I did not realize was that the nest of bees that are out there. So luckily I was a little bit more limber at the time. And when I started hearing the, I started hearing the buzzing before I saw the buzzing. So I did like this matrix lean back thing and then just kind of laid in the kayak and floated for a little while before I came back up because I was so scared. I was like, okay, if I go face first in the bees, I'm going in the water and that's probably where the alligators are. So I definitely, obviously, obviously, I need to hear what Raphael has to say about risk management <laughs> because could probably use a dose of it. Didn't you have a risk registry to go for kayaking? Like you stopped and you talked about all that stuff. No, oh, okay. no, That's a good no. One. I could, you know, I mean, my risk register included to wear a hat so I don't get sunburn, use <laughs> sunscreen, keep an eye out for the alligators, but like. I didn't think about the bees. I thought about like, okay, the snakes hang out in the trees and they could fall. And one other time I had went and I put my hand on one of the trees and then I looked over and there was a giant, it wasn't a tarantula, but had a gigantic spider. And I was like, never again. So, but yeah. <laughs> so that's an unknown. I didn't go, unknown. I didn't go totally prepared, obviously. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I see people joining in the in the chat too. Hey, Brian. So, hey, Katie. So, and hello, Raphael. Raphael, which day are you flying out to the conference? I'm flying tomorrow, actually, at tomorrow. Uh, eight thirty my time, oh. uh, nine thirty oh. your time. So I'll be there very early, like about ten a.m. Uh, San it's, Diego. You'll be time. in San yeah. Diego time yeah. at ten a.m. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there at about twelve o'clock, and I was trying to communicate with my team at work, going, okay. I can still stay connected and I can check email messages and all of that kind of stuff, but it won't be until about two o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> type of thing. So, but yeah, so. It's, good. it's a good break. Everybody at work are allowed to not call me or text me or email me because I'm not going to reply. I'll try not to. <laughs> we've, we've got a bit going on at work. So I've told him, I said, okay. I said, I will be available within a, kind of within reason, you know, it's like moving milestones forward, getting stuff, testing, communicating, testing results, you know, but as far as like the stand up meetings and all of that in the morning, I'm like, no, I'm going to be in the air, be busy on that. So, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to a little bit of change of scenery and, you know, one of my big hopes on the animal thing, obviously, is seeing the seals at La Jolla. Like I looked up the beach and apparently they have seals out there. And since oh, never... really? I, I've never been like it's going to be a first time. Everybody's telling me it's beautiful. So I'm looking forward to it. Do you Tanya, mean La Jolla? It's, it's La Jolla. Yes, it's, it's La Jolla. La Jolla. Okay. Yeah, See, yeah. I, I read it like La Jolla. <laughs> it's like from here. <laughs> Don't worry, I did the same thing when I lived in California. I didn't know how to pronounce anything properly and it was it's embarrassing, a, but it's okay. Well, that's like Louisiana too, like a chafalaya and chafonto and all of the things that throw people off. <laughs> so, but, um, well, hey, let's see. I'm gonna look down at this. So we've got about 58 persistence so far. So everybody that's joining us, welcome. If you're joining us for the first time, please tell us where you are from. And I was thinking about a couple of ideas a little bit earlier, too. Even if you're not joining us for the first time, we, we've had about 158 people that have registered for this. Like I was telling Raphael, our speaker, usually what we've been seeing about this past year, past year and a half of virtuals, is we wind up having about, you know, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the signups that attend. So I'd love to hear, you know, too, where people are from and also what industry are you from? I think that's a question that has never been asked in these before. I 
And also anybody that wants to take themselves uh, and turn your camera on, I love it. So far, I can only see Raphael and Katie. <laughs> All right. So in Raphael, we're going to give it we're going to give it just a bit more for people to join. Like I said, it's it's usually it winds up being around 540 to 545 because people just kind of progressively join. So. All right. Brian's from Houston. Andrew's from New Orleans. Tori from Lafayette, Baton Rouge. Uh, Shockey's from Michigan. And then Raphael from, uh, I keep on, so it's Ontario is where the Manitoba chapter is, correct? Oh, no, actually, and, and that's probably confusing because I am the elected president of the PMI Manitoba chapter, and Manitoba is the province where I am the president of the chapter. But because of work, I have relocated to Kingston, Ontario, and I'm here all the way to August, and then I'm going to fly back to Manitoba. But I'm here in Ontario right now, right about six hours south of New York. So I can go to New York if I want to. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> six hours driving. I haven't been there, but um, yeah. So I'll, I'll go back to Manitoba, which is the chapter I am the president um, by okay. August. Now our chapter has about nine 900. Well, we hit the 1,000 member uh, last year, but it went down to 900 now. But yeah, it's a, it's a very good chapter. And I truly believe that our community, the project management community, we are as strong as all the members we have and how we can help each other, right? We're changing the world one project at a time by helping each other, making everything better, risk management, stakeholder, talking about our projects, our challenges, and being open about it, right? So I agree. So thank you so much. And I, I agree with that too. I mean, to me, this is, I've been part of a lot of different organizations, but this is one that has remained the most connected, you know, not only on a local level, but also the global level. I mean, I've been involved in it since 2014 and on the board since 2017 and just being able to have that community of other project managers and other professionals that are in different places too, and especially after we went through the pandemic, just corresponding and seeing the different ways that people work, it kind of gives you a different idea to bring back to the local level as well. So that's been very helpful. And even in the, um, you know, for those of y'all that were joining and hearing us talk about La Jolla, so what's going on with that? is that PMI National is having what's called LIM. It's a Leaders Institute uh, Management Conference. They just started these back up uh, um, last year for the first time in Orlando after the pandemic. And it's an opportunity that people that are serving in a volunteer capacity as chapter board members can go out and meet with one another. You know, it's about three days worth of conference and breakout events and just share different ideas and different ways of working that they can bring back to their chapters and to their members to kind of inspire future leaders and just share different ideas. So we'll be heading out for that. We'll be heading out for that tomorrow. And then on our chapter, um, Emily, who's our VP of membership and Corey, who's our VP of finance, will be joining from the Baton Rouge side. And we're looking forward to kind of sharing all the ideas with the chapter once we come back. And so. And I'm Akala and Emily, did you want to jump on and say a few things? I might have kind of surprised him. <laughs> so. Let's see. All right. Well, I guess we can go ahead and get started. So for those that you're joining us tonight, thank you for joining us. I'm Tanya Boyd, the president of the Baton Rouge chapter. So, and tonight, we have the privilege of having Raphael Vitarelli from the PMI Manitoba chapter in Canada. So you work for a digital, digital smile. You also, I think you teach at the Winnipeg University, correct? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, a, I have a little. I actually have one, one slide here that I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. But in, mm -hmm. in short, yeah, I am the uh, president elect at PMI Manitoba. I truly believe we're changing the world one project at a time, and it's awesome to be connected with the people in the industry. I love to do this. I have done it uh, this risk management presentation and others to other chapters. Um, I uh, I work for Smile Digital Health. We are a healthcare IT company. We are delivering better global health um, by enabling uh, patients, payers, providers, and other institutions to exchange patient data. Um, we can talk a little bit about that too. And I saw, I saw a lot of people are in the healthcare industry. Maybe we can use some examples on risk management in healthcare. And I teach project management at the University of Winnipeg. So those are the three things I, I try and do and <laughs> balance my time. Okay. I did want to ask just one quick question before we get started on questions that come through the chat, do you prefer to have the questions at the end or kind of intermittently? Because I will help moderate during the beginning. Yeah, no, that's a, a good question. I, I love when it's more interactive. I think we learn more and digest the information if we are interactive, if we ask specific questions related to our work, to the way we are managing projects, managing risks, and we interact. I think that goes very well. So if ever you want to mute yourself, ask the question. I would love that. If you want to keep your camera on, I love that as well. If for some reason you want to keep it off, no problem. If you feel more comfortable in sharing in the chat, you can always stop me and say, hey, there's a question in the chat i'll keep monitoring as we go but if there's a question i always like to answer it right away instead of leaving it at the end with that said i will leave some time at the end so we can talk about things as well but questions every time if you want to stop me and ask i love that that's how i perform best i'll watch the chat too and help you out with that if we see any so with that i'll let you you let you share and get started all right here we go let me share my screen Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Can you tell me if you see PMI Manitoba in the center and like three little uh, three balls and Raphael and see risk management? Is that what you see? Is it in the entire screen? Right now, I just see Raphael, VP of Operations Manit. Oh, okay, there it goes. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. Is it for everybody else? Like, is that what you see? You see the screen I'm sharing? Great. Okay. Good. I always ask that question because I have three screens. So it's always a challenge to get the right one. I'm make sure everybody's looking at the right thing. Okay. So for today, what I'm going to try and bring to the table is an approach uh, combining Prince2. We're going to talk a little bit more about what Prince2 is. And PMBOK, PMBOK V6 and PMBOK V7. All of them, they talk about risk management. They are different approaches to project management. But the way I see the different approaches to things, specifically when it comes to risk or when it comes to anything related to project management, it's not like, oh, I do Scrum, therefore I'm better. I am Agile and I'm better. I am Prince2 and I'm better. Or I'm PMBOK and I'm better. No, I don't think so. I think it's all the tools out there, they can be used for different scenarios, for different approaches. And if you know what they are, you might be able to use them when you need them, right? They are helping you. I, I try and think about uh, Batman and his belt with different tools, and he's going to use different tools for different enemies or different battles that he's going to go into. And that's how I see every approach out there. We got to get as project manager, project managers exposure to different approaches so we can actually use them in each case and specific projects, especially right now in the 21st century, we have a lot of different challenges, a lot of people working from home. So the more approaches you have out there, the better you can be at performing your work. So what I'm going to bring to you today is a combined approach uh, in terms of risk management, not only bringing examples from PMI Manitoba, but as well as from the PMBOK V6 and 7 and Prince G. So in the agenda for today, we have a couple things and we're going to dive into them as we go through this. But basically the meat and potato and what I want you to keep in mind is once we're done with this, I'm gonna have something that you can take home, something that you can take to your project, to your work. And again, PMBOK says that project uh, definition of project is anything that has a start and end date that will generate a service, a product, or a result, right? And it has stakeholders and was never done before. So even if you're not in a project management role right now, I'm pretty sure you are managing projects in your personal life uh, at work. You're always managing different types of projects based on the definition, right? That PMBOK has out there. I, I even me, um, as an immigrant who moved to Canada, 
Um, I was born in Brazil. I do think that that was a major project in my life. Maybe one of the more important ones was moving from Brazil to Canada, right? A lot of risks, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of change management, a lot of things involved into that. So everything you do in life could be considered a project and you can use some of the techniques to make your life better, not only professionally, but also personally. So we're gonna dive into these. But once I'm done with this presentation, you're gonna take home a tool that you can use uh, I call it a tool, it's a fancy name for a spreadsheet where you can actually see how you can manage your risks, uh, where you can leverage, what you can do. I know a lot of you might have a PPM, Project Portfolio Management Solution out there, or a project management solution that has some risk management inputs that you can leverage. But as long as you understand what is in the background, how the technique is applied, you can put it anywhere. I'm going to give you that spreadsheet. There's two conditions for you to get it, but we'll talk about it as we go through. And there's no cost associated to it or anything like that. I don't, I never charge for any of my speaks because I think that every time I go to PMI and talk about risk and talk about anything, I think you are helping me more than I'm helping you. That's why I need the collaboration as we go through this. So ask questions and talk about what are our challenges and make each one of us better at managing projects and delivering our product, service, our result as we go through this. Does that make sense? Makes total sense. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so questions are more than welcome and encouraged at all times. So stop me, ask questions on the chat, unmute yourself, whatever you feel more comfortable, okay? All right, and if you see me looking to the left, it's because I'm looking at my monitor at the left where I'm presenting the screen. It's not that I'm not paying attention to you. I'm always looking at everybody's faces. If you turn your camera on, I'll see you over here and we're gonna interact. Don't feel that you have to turn it on, but if you do, I appreciate that. So announce yourself. If you wanna ask the question, just say, hey, this is uh, Raphael, I got a question. And I'll stop right away and answer what the question is. And actually I perform better as you ask questions and we interact. Um, everybody engaged, so be present and speak up. Um, a little bit about myself here. I know you might have read the, uh, the bio there, but I always like to walk through a couple things that I think help me um, understand and be a little bit better at managing projects and collaborate with the community. The first thing here is that I am an instructor at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, we have a big program in terms of project management. It's a one-year full-time diploma program where you come out as a with a diploma program for project management and it's very applied. So we try and have very specific and applied techniques for the students that come in. We get people with 40 years of experience. We get people with five years just coming off of university, but everybody that goes and join our course in project management, they do have uh, a little bit of experience in the industry. It doesn't, not specifically in project management, some of them do, but a lot of them do have a professional experience. I am the president-elect at uh, PMI Manitoba. So that's something I'm looking forward to. My Right now I'm the VP of operations and the president-elect. So my term is gonna start on March, 2024 as the president. I'm really looking forward to that. And for any of you that are here, I think one way to not only give back to the community, but also learn more and get better and have connections and people that can help you is participating and being part of your chapter. So if ever you guys have board board positions, I would say try and apply, try and be involved with the community. That helps a lot, helps help me a lot and find a lot of different resources and, and people that are great out there. Um, in terms of certifications, I have a couple of uh, project management certifications, um, but the main ones that I really like to show is the PMI ACP. So it's the Agile Practitioner, uh, I think, uh, I think, Tanya, you have it as well, right? The PMI ACP you mentioned, right? Yeah, this certification came out a couple of years ago. It's very recent, but it's very good. Like if you're wanting to learn more about Agile, for me, that made a, lot, a big change in the way I see projects after I completed that certification. I have the PMP uh, certification as well as the PRINCE2. We're going to dive into PRINCE2. If you don't know what it is, we'll talk about it as we go through this presentation. Um, academic background, uh, I have the project management diploma from the University of Winnipeg. And that's actually funny because I, as part of the immigration process, I needed to study project management. I needed to study something for a year or more so that Canada could give me a work permit for me to stay in Canada at the time. 
And I was lucky enough that at the end of the diploma program, they hired me as an instructor. So I was like, oh, yay, they like me, I'll come back. <laughs> and the University of Winnipeg has helped me a lot. So I'm immensely uh, grateful for, for them. I have an MBA from the university uh, back in Brazil. They had a connection with the University of Tampa in the US. So I spent a little bit of time there too. It was fun. Uh, my background, however, is IT. So IT is what I live and breathe. So project management, I see three pillars in my life is project management and IT. And then on top of that is people. I think the more I talk to people, collaborate and learn from them, the better I can get at IT and project management. So that's a little bit about me. And here is my professional experience. I back home in Brazil, I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Managed a couple projects there. It was very fun. We had a big service desk migration from Brazil to Uruguay. So that was one of our biggest projects. And also a global alignment, uh, Google tools. So we basically, PwC is in about 200 countries and we made sure that they aligned and were using the same tool. And at that time was Google. And I think they're still using it, Google for everything. Have Google Cloud, Google for emails. It was a very nice uh, big project as well. In Canada, most of my time here was in healthcare. So I worked for uh, Manitoba Health as a project slash program manager. And most recently right now, I work for Smile Digital Health as a portfolio director. That's a portfolio and service delivery. So I have a very big team of awesome people that help me grow and get better at what I do. We have 40, 48 people right now with managers, project managers, business analysts, and we deliver better global health by helping customers like in the US and Canada, hospitals, clinics, payers and providers have patient integration. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Oh, and one specific example that I like to talk about and as we dive into this is here for project for Manitoba eHealth. One of my biggest project, which I'm gonna use as an example for this presentation is was a data, not data migration, this was a hospital upgrade. So we were upgrading a core switch in one of our biggest hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So that had to have a lot of risk management into it, but we'll talk about it as we go through this presentation. Does that, does that make sense? Is it okay. Okay. As always, you can stop me and ask questions. I love to bring personal things to my presentation, make it more personable, make it uh, better and easier for us to have an open conversation. And here are my beautiful dogs. Uh, we moved uh, from Winnipeg. We went all the way down to Detroit. It was a big trip that we had. So driving with uh, two cars all the way to Kingston. So we were like Winnipeg down and I'm gonna show you the route we went and we're gonna use some risk management associated to that trip. And down below on the right is me and my partner. We were at the Niagara Falls. It was part of our trip moving from Winnipeg to Kingston, Ontario. And we're gonna go back to Winnipeg in August, I'm hoping. And these are our beautiful kids, uh, little dogs. And uh, the, the picture on the left is Cassie and Bronx. Cassie is the black gray Dane, Bronx is the lab and shepherd. And they are sleeping on a hotel bed. And it was very hard to get hotels that could accept our little doggy. So it was, it was a fun trip. <laughs> now let's dive into this. What's the objective for you? Why do you manage risks in your projects? What's the objective of managing risks in your projects? I don't need everybody to speak, but at least one or two people, if you can let me know what is the objective of you managing risks in your project? Why do you do that? And if you do that. Well, I can go first. I'm Katie. Hey, um, the objective for me for managing risks in projects is um, to try to prevent the gotcha moments. You know, like the more I can sort of see around the corners and just think outside of the box with other people, the better I can help everybody prepare for what might show up and how we're going to handle it. Right, avoid the gotchas. Okay, I like that. I love that actually. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Anybody else? Well, Charles here in the chat says avoid failures. Okay. So you don't get fired. <laughs> so you don't get fired. I like it. <laughs> As a project manager. After anything. <laughs> All right, I love it. Uh, here we also, have. Also, you know, to have um, a way to recover, you know, 
no, no, I'm not joking about it, but if uh, you plan it correctly, at least you have a some kind of recovery that you can try to put in place. I'm not saying that it will work all the times, but you know, hmm. it's better than nothing. I see a way to recover, uh, get the gotchas, avoid failure. Okay, I, I hear yeah. lots of great stuff. It's like um, it's like uh, carry a gun in downtown in one of the cities down, you know. All right, I see. I you hear know, you. It's great management now. <laughs> and we have here also setting expectations and plan ahead for potential failures. I look for opportunities more than the risks. Oh, I like that too. So Tori says, I look for opportunities. So, so not get fired, get the gotchas. Um, and here as well, look for opportunities, right? So this is good. It's good to remind ourselves that risk is also about opportunities, right? That's how PM Block looks at it. It's not only threats, but also opportunities, right? So there's the risk here that uh, Raf and his family are gonna move to, um, another province and you're going to drive to the U.S. And that was actually something that happened. We drove down to the U.S. and we had to fill up our tanks. And at that time, the gas in the U.S. was way cheaper. And that was an opportunity that wasn't anywhere. We didn't put in the risk registry or anywhere else. When we got to U.S., like, oh, it's way cheaper here. So before we crossed the border back to Canada, we thought, let's fill up our tanks, right? So we took advantage of that opportunity. And it happens a lot <clears throat> with a lot of our projects. As we go through this, we might find opportunities out there. So it's always good to look for those things as well. So very nice. Increase stakeholder confidence. Yeah, that's another very big and important one, right? As you talk about the risks, you're more confident that your project is being managed well. You're more confident that you are giving them options and showing them how to do those things, right? And again, I understand that a lot of stakeholders out there, depending on the company you are, what, what you're doing, they might not be used to risk management. It might be something new to them. So you got to make sure that you go slow and show the value, let them see the value, and then maybe you go full blown to a risk management strategy to how you're going to manage those down the road looking for good risk opportunities. Very nice. Okay, so here's how I see it. And thank you uh, for the ones that spoke up. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the ones that shared in the chat as well. This is awesome. That's, that's how I like to play this game. It's very nice if we collaborate as we go through it. Okay, so for me, risk management gives us the ability to shape the future. It's very powerful, right? Like you can shape the future of your project by implementing risk management. And what are the things involved in you doing this? If you do it earlier on, it's little effort, right? So you know that every risk, everything that will come to your project, if you didn't invest the time at the beginning, regardless if it's an agile software development project or a full-on implementation project or a full-on, I saw some people in the manufacturing industry here, full-on plant implementation. It doesn't matter what it is. If you do it at the beginning and you do it well with little effort, write questions, right? Empower the people to answer those questions, right? So if I'm working here with Katie and Katie is the senior architect and she knows a lot and say, hey, Katie, well, let's talk about this. We're having a risk meeting here. And then Katie says, oh, this, uh, this is a risk I saw in one of my, my big architecture projects and it could be a potential risk for us. If my response to Katie is, Katie, no, no, this is not a problem for this project, don't worry. Never again, Katie is going to say anything about risk. My project is going to fail. Nobody's going to collaborate, right? So make sure that people have that safe environment. They have the safe psychological safety to collaborate. And more, moreover, if you can not assign the risk action, who's going to take the responsibility for doing something about that risk? Not, don't assign it to Katie if you don't have to, because then it's going to be good. Katie's like, oh, great. They brought a risk. They documented it. They're working on it and didn't assign to me. So I'm going to continue on thinking about stuff and we'll bring it to them, right? Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes your team is small and, and Katie maybe knows more about, the, more about that than other people, but give them the ability to ask the right questions, make that safe environment and show why that's important. And with that and the right people, you can get significant returns, right? So very simple, you can shape the future. That's how I see it by applying little effort, asking the right questions, and being, being able to get the people in the room that can ask the right question and answer them and help you go through this. Because as a project manager, I, I have a big portfolio and some of my projects, I understand them very technically and down to what they're trying to implement, but I'm not, not even close to as good as my architects and the people that are in my projects. 
and I have to empower them to bring the questions and the concerns to me and I got to listen. If I don't, then it's going to be a big problem and I won't have all the answers. Does, does this make sense like conceptually? Yeah. Okay, Tanya, quick uh, check here. I have um, one hour to go, right? So I can... That is correct. Okay. We go until seven. Perfect. Awesome. Love that. Okay, so let's go. And you can always ask questions and stop me as we go through this, okay? All right. So PMBOK V6 and V7, as you know, is a guide to the project management body of knowledge. PRINCE2 is projects in controlled environments. So PRINCE2 is a structured project management method. You see, I bold them, guide, body of knowledge, and the other one is a method. Prince 2 was created in 1969 was our PM block, right? Let me see, I actually have a note in here. Yeah, 1969 was the, the meeting in Philadelphia with uh, Jim and Gordon, and they that's where the PMI became this big thing that it is today. And Prince 2 was actually in the UK in 1989, and Prince 2 was initially created to manage IT projects. It was focused only on projects in the UK. Today, Prince 2 is very big. It's behind us as the PMI, PM box. So I, I love us and I think PMI is awesome. But I also think that other tools out there are important for us to know and apply them. Prince 2 today has become also a certification, a professional certification in project management that applies to all industry like the PM box. Um, and it has a different approach to it. It's more of a method, it's more of a step-by-step -step of how to do things. And PM box is more of a guide. Right, so a body of knowledge. So that's the distinction I make, and let's see how we can combine them and how can they can help us. But before we do that, here's a little bit of an approach to the risk management in PMBOK V6 and PMBOK V7. On the original PMBOK V6, which still applies if you're trying to write your PMP, you still have to read this big book uh, that is actually downstairs. My my partner, she is in the Air Force, and she's she's studying to get her PMP. It's like she got excited about it. So I was like, yay, nice. So she has all my books downstairs. She's studying for it. Anyway, on Prince Chu, uh, on PMBOK V6, we had the 10 knowledge errors, which still applies for your PMP certification. You got to read, got to make sure you understand. And one of the knowledge areas was risk management. And in here, it said, the objective of project risk management is to increase the probability and or impact of a positive risks, positive risk, and to decrease the probability and or impact of negative risks. And it's funny that they start with positive risk first, right? And we never, almost never, we think about the positive side, the, the opportunities of your risk. So, and then they close it off by saying to optimize uh, the chances of project success. So shaping the future, right? Not getting, getting fired. What, what are my gotchas, right? PMBOK V7, however, said, you know what? And that's, that's how I look at PMBOK V7 is PMBOK V7 is a step back, right? PMBOK V6 is all the details and meat and potato of five process groups and 10 knowledge areas and what we can do in each of them and all of that cool stuff. PMBOK V7 is a step back and say, hey, I am more strategic and I'm looking here from the more high level and I'm a smaller book, right? And I'll give you some references here if you want to dive. And then it says, I have 12 principles for you. And one of them is to optimize risk responses. And then in the optimized risk responses, PMBOK V7 says, continually evaluate exposure to risk, both opportunities and threats, to maximize positive impacts and minimize negative impacts on the project and its outcomes. But then PMBOK V7 goes down a little bit and says, hey, I also have my eight performance domains here. And in the performance domains, I have one that is called uncertainty performance domain, which are risks are an aspect of uncertainty. A risk is an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has a positive or negative effect on one or more project objectives. So I really like the connection, right? It's like, okay, Raph, you talked about a practical workshop and you've been giving us lots of vision and stuff, beautiful, but how can I use all that stuff that you're talking about, right? How, how can we combine those things? And we're gonna get there, don't worry. Let's, let's, let's dive into this and always stop me if you have a question. I am monitoring the chat as we go. Uh, if there's any questions here. Oh, is there any question that I might have missed? No way. No, I was typing a big block of just kind of information about pinbox six versus seven. Oh yeah, good. 
This is very good. Yeah, you can download it from the website. If you're a member, you can log in and download the V6 and V7. Yeah, yeah and a lot of other. And the stuff biggest too. way is just even looking through that exam, not exam outline, but like the table of contents. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody that's familiar with six or five or anything before, as soon as they get to that table of contents of seven, they can kind of go, ah, yes, this looks very different. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's a different approach. I really liked it. Okay. All right. So Prince 2 2017, that's the last version of Prince 2. Prince 2 has a very similar approach. If you look into this, they say, I'm going to call it seven themes. And those have to be continually, oh, where is it? Where's my, okay. Prince two themes are areas of project management which must be addressed continuously throughout the project. So instead of having our five process groups or our interactions, Prince two says, you know what, here's your business case. And your business case has your return investment and your assessment, but that's a live document. That's Prince two. This is my business case, a live document. As you progress through the project, make sure you come back here and you update it. Like things change. Now you're going to spend more money. You're going to need more people. Therefore, your ROI is late, is a little bit less. Your organization and process assets, right? All the things that we have here, they say, yeah, so here's another point that you have to focus. And then Prince2 comes up with those seven uh, themes that you have to focus on. And one of them is risk management. So the purpose of the risk theme is to identify, assess, and control uncertainties. And as a result, improve the ability of projects succeed project to succeed right so very nice they're very good at this and they're focused on risks as well but now let's dive into specific things that i really like about pmbok and prince2 pmbok says we have seven risk responses sorry actually eight risk responses it has escalate says okay escalate is for threat and opportunity you can escalate a threat and you can escalate an opportunity as well, right? For me, like I have client projects, let's say I'm diving into a project, a specific project, let's say it's a payer or provider in the US and I notice that they, they could get help on the specific area. It's like, wow, there's a very good opportunity here for us to dive into. Maybe that's gonna go in my risk registry and I'm gonna sign a person to help me out, make sure that we can explore that opportunity. That also applies to a threat. Maybe it's a threat, maybe it's something that we're gonna fail because of how their environment is set up whatever the case might be, I wanna escalate it to my director of architecture so they can take a look at that, see if our product will be good fit for that. Just a silly example, of course. So, and then PMBOK goes down and says, you have accept, which applies for threat and opportunity. You have avoid, say so avoid is only for threats. Transfer, only for threats. Mitigates for threats. Exploit, share and enhance. And then Prince2 on the other side says, well, yeah, I have some similar approaches and similar responses, but, you can see here that Prince2 also believes that sharing is not only for threats, but also for opportunities. So Prince2 says, well, you could share threats as well. You could share opportunities. We believe so, right? You can buy an insurance for something like, I don't know, you're, 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 I'm going to move from Winnipeg, go down to the US. Maybe I got a car insurance. Let's say I didn't have it. It's not possible. At least in the province I was, you got to have a car insurance. But let's say I didn't have it. I could get car insurance and then I'm sharing the threat of crashing my car and not losing a lot of money and getting that paid by the insurance company, right? But then in here, there's one specific change that they make. While PMBOK says it's to mitigate, Prince Chu says, well, it's reduce. We're going to reduce the risk. We're going to reduce that specific threat. And then here connects to what I forgot who said, a friend, I think it was a friend who said that, oh, you got to be ready if something go wrong, you got to do something about it. And I really like it because Prince Chu says you got to prepare contingency plan. So one specific example, my core switch upgrade on the big hospital in Winnipeg, we plan for that for six months. And as part of our contingency plan, if the new system was live, Monday morning and the nurses and doctors and practitioners were not able to use it, we had a fallback plan to go back to the old system. And if that didn't work, we had extra nurses and extra hospital staff in there. We paid extra for it because if the system for some reason broke and we tested a lot, we tried to mitigate as much as we could. But if that broke, we would need extra staff in the hospital to make sure that we're intaking patient, that we're taking care of the patient and it's people's lives that we're taking care of, right? So if the system is not there, we would be able to completely run the hospital without having any impact or very minimal impact to the customers and the patients, right? So preparing contingency plan 
And now I see clearly why Prince Chu was done for IT, IT things and turned into this big thing is that they had a specific approach to everything. If you get those two books, the Prince Chu book, and you go through their risk management approach, they have very specific steps that you can take. But you don't have to get the book because as we go through this presentation, I'm going to show you what they tell and what you could use, and I'm going to combine with the PM block. Sounds good? Sounds good. I did have a question that came through from uh, from Jonathan. How is a positive risk distinct from an opportunity? Very good. They're both the same thing. It's an opportunity. It's a positive uh, risk. Okay. All right. Thank you for the question, though. I love that. Okay, here we go. Um, and share, right? Okay. Now, here in my little trip that I drove from Winnipeg all the way up here, went down to Minneapolis and then Chicago, Detroit, Toronto and Kingston with my two big dogs and my partner, right? One risk that we had was that here in Chicago, we were not able to get a hotel that could accept dogs that were over 100 pounds. And actually, in their policy we read in the website, they said that it was up to 50 or 60 pounds dog. And we had two dogs and they were both over 100. So we were like, oh, this is a big risk. Um, what can we do? And of course, we're not crazy. We didn't have a risk registry or anything like that for our trip, but we thought about it. It's like, you know what? Let's take it. Let's just go. Um, we could book another hotel that we would pay extra or find something else or don't stop at that city, right? Take a completely different approach. But we wanted to stop there and we wanted to enjoy it as well. So we thought, let's go. Uh, the approach we're going to take is uh, sh she walked to the to the guy and, and got signing the papers, and I walked with the dogs inside after I got the the ticket. Right, it's not a very good approach, but I thought they are not they are not too had they they don't look well. They are big, but I didn't think that the hotel was going to wait our dogs and say they are not allowed. To. We basically accepted it and had a couple things that we could do now. Could we done? Could have? Could we have done this better? Yeah, maybe we could. Maybe we could get a Airbnb and thought it through and done it better, and we could have shaped our future. But we accepted that risk and said we're going to go and do it. And if it doesn't work, then we just continue driving. And in, at night, we just call someone and try to find another place, another hotel that we can go, maybe a different city. So we took that risk, and we were with wide eyes open that we knew that could happen. Now the big difference here is, let's say it was a small project that you were working on. If your stakeholders are aware, that's the decision you're taking. And that was documented and agreed by everybody. And in my case, it was just me and her. That's great. We're good and united in shaping our future. And we know what the future is going to bring. Now, if we didn't talk about it, and you as a project manager thought, yeah, that's what the website says, but I'm not going to share with my partner because she's the sponsor here. And she's the boss. And she's going to get mad. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. If we face the problem, we're not able to stay in the hotel the backlash, the being fired, right, was going to be a big problem, right? So just talking about simply asking the right questions with little effort and talking about it and documenting it is going to make a big change. So keep, keep that in mind as we go through this. And here, and this picture on the left was the hotel in Chicago, and they were allowed to enter because we kind of, we were a little sneaky, right? We got the ticket, and then I walked in with the dogs. They didn't complain. We walked out with them every day and every hour, and well, every couple of hours, we would walk out. They didn't say anything, but it was, it was a, a little bit of a risk there that we decided to take. Now, Raf, when it comes to project management, what are your suggested steps that we can take? Here's my suggested one. Again, you're going to assess your stakeholder, talk to your company, talk to your team, see what works for them. Maybe it's a new company, just join. See if they have a risk management department. How do they manage their risk? Do we have other project managers in here that have delivered other projects, how they manage it? Is it an agile approach? Do they put it on Jira? Do they have a MS project? Is it an Excel spreadsheet? Do they understand what risk is, right? Go slow, but here's a couple steps that you can take or not take, but think about them. Identify the risks, make sure that that goes into your portfolio. If you're managing a big portfolio, you have a portfolio risks, a program risk, and make sure that from a project standpoint that they, those are identified in the project charter. I understand that a lot of project charters, they have risks, but you don't have a lot of time to investigate them, to dive into them. That's okay, just document what those, those risks are. One very big trick here, if you want to write it down, that is very important for me, it makes a lot of sense, is your assumptions. 
they can turn and they will turn into risks, right? So I assume that the hotel in Chicago is going to let me get in with my dogs. And then I put that on my assumption log, boom, or I put that on my charter, boom, very good. That's my assumption. But now if I look at all my assumptions, they can also turn into risks. If my assumption here is wrong, therefore my dogs are not allowed, therefore I'm screwed. So the thing that I try and do is if you spend all of that time putting assumptions together, look at them from a lens of risk perspective and turn them around, right? So it's a very easy way of tracking your assumptions in the assumption log and making a connection to your risks, right? Just think about that. I Actually, that was, oh, the book that uh, we used for the PMP certification, uh, the ACP certification. The guy that wrote it, his name is Mike Griffin. And we brought him in PMI Manitoba for one of our conferences. And he was the one that brought this concept to me. He was the one that talked about it. It was like assumptions into risks. And I was like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. I really liked it. So keep that in mind if you didn't know it. But if you did, that's awesome. Risk management strategy created, including impact and probability matrix. Now, everybody does that, or a lot of people do, and they know, oh, I know what an impact is. I know what probability is. And we know that PM Box says you multiply the impact by probability and you have a risk score. Great, but do people know what actually impact is, right? If I say, hey, here's the impact. Oh, the impact is a five. Oh yeah, five is nice, right? It's like, what is five? Oh, no, but impact is one. Oh, yeah, it's a one. Very good. It's a one impact. So it's not much impact. It's a lot or not much. Talk about it, right? I'm going to show you how you can talk about it and get people to agree. Don't, don't push it down their throat and say, this is what I believe you should be, but collaborate. There's a little bit of, um, I forgot who said that. Was it? I don't remember who said that, but they said uh, that uh, if you show me, if you tell me, I'll forget. If you teach me, I might remember, but if you involve me, I'll learn, right? So involve them in your risk management approach. Involve them as you go through this. And then in terms of execution, monitoring, controlling your project, I suggest biweekly risk meeting, just about risk. I know you have your risk log with you as you go through any project meeting. I know you're keeping your ears open to anything that comes in but have a specific meeting to talk about risk. Doesn't matter if you're agile or not, uh, have a specific sprint to review your, meetings, your, your, your risks, right? To talk about them, maybe set time aside for it. Very important. And then lastly, of course, when you close your projects, the risk you documented and you mitigated or did not, you know what? They can turn into lessons learned, right? Very easily. It's like, wow, I invested all that time. Now those things can help me on putting a big, nice lessons learned together. Okay. Now, in the future that you are shaping for your portfolio or program, maybe all the project managers in your team, that's the thing that they do too. So anytime you're looking at a project, you know you can go to the risk registry, you know their lessons learned is going to be connected and it's going to help you shape the future, not only for your projects, but for other projects as well. I'd like to ask an opinion, and this actually got triggered from a, con, uh, a, a comment from Tori. Tori said that they utilize Microsoft Teams and SharePoint to host their project charters and risk documentation, and it's useful because everybody can see the, the dashboard. Rafaela, in your experience, what are some of the better tools or good tools that you've had the opportunity to use? Because not all organizations may have them, and some may be kind of assessing the tools that they have to keep up with things. Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine a couple of hours ago before this meeting, and he's working on a business case for a big city in Canada. And they are trying to implement a project portfolio management tool and project management tool for the entire city. They have big projects, they have different projects. And their goal is for reporting, um, make sure that the corporate understand all the projects that are underneath. And we were talking about this. And, and I said, his name is John. I said, John, for me, it's three pillars. It's people, process, and then systems, right? So if you have the right people that understand risk management and see the value of it, great, that's where you start. And then process, if you have the right process, we know that at the beginning of the project, we capture risks and throughout we monitor them and we get we empower people. And then at the end, we're gonna use that for, for lessons learned. Then you have the people in the process. Now, 
the last one is going to be easy, the system, because you already have the people that understand it and you have the process in place. The system is going to be easy. You're going to have to use what works for, for you, for your organization. I came from a company a couple of years ago that was full on Microsoft. So exactly like the comment in here, we had SharePoint, a different SharePoint for project. We had everything documented in spreadsheet or Microsoft project. We were trying to move to a Microsoft uh, Power Platform and manage our entire portfolio within Microsoft. And that was going to work very well if, and we did at the time, had the people that understood the, the value of it and the processes in place. If our process was not good, paying millions of dollars to get a nice system in was not going to help us. So my answer to that question is there are a lot of tools out there. And as long as you have the people in the, pro the, the, people in the processes in place, they're going to help you move forward. Um, there are some research by Gartner that they talk about uh, Microsoft Project Online. There is the, um, there is, I forgot the, the second one. The second, actually, the first place is Project Plan View was a research by, done in 2019, where Gartner said that they were one of the best project portfolio and project management when it came to risks. So there are a lot of tools out there. Today, I am a Google shop. Everything I do is in Google. I have some other tools in the back for agile project management, and they only work well because we have the process in the background. I know it's a it's an answer, but not an answer. I'm kind of getting out of your, well, what tool? It's because it really depends on what your, your need is going to be, a specific need for your organization. But please, please focus on the people and process first as you go through that. Does that, does that answer the question? That is to, that's, to, that's totally fair because it's tailoring and it depends upon the culture and it depends upon the expenses. Katie uh, had a question as well. And I, th I think this kind of ties in a lot with change management, but it's a very good question. How do you reduce the risk when moving to a new software, especially when some folks are attached to the old software? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a good one. Um, what I what I like, I don't a lot of you might have heard about it. I, I don't know where my ad card book is, but there's this, um, I don't know if you heard about ProSci and their change management approach and how you manage change, not only from a project, but from a corporate standpoint. And one thing that they bring to the table that I really like is identifying who are the people that are going to be champions and help you with that change. So let's say you get Kathy and Kathy says, oh, I love this new system and I used it in my previous company. It's very good. So then you get Kathy to influence and talk about that with her team and get people to buy into it. But you also identify people that don't like the new system, that are going to be the ones anchoring you down and that won't go want to go to that new direction. Let's say I'll pick on you, Max. I'll say Max is the one that doesn't want to take on the new system and he doesn't believe it's good and he thinks he's been using the old system for a very, very long time and that's going to be a big pain for him. you got to also understand that and, and you can leverage where Max is coming from to understand the other stakeholders. I would say sit down with Max and say, Max, hey, tell me why it's uh, you believe it's going to be a problem. And Max might make a big list to you and say, hey, I've been doing this for years and now you're going to change this. It's going to be stressful to me. But Max might say, well, I'm about to retire and this is just makes no sense, man. Why, why are you doing this? I say, okay, so the concern here, Max, is the training and the impact it's going to have on your job. Okay, what if we take everything out that is on your plate right now, give you some time, sit down, and you can be trained on the system and provide some feedback to us, what you don't like, what you do like, right? Spend that time. And I think that's a big, big mistake that we make in a lot of co corporate changes. And I, I'm at fault as well. Sometimes I'm over... Sometimes I have a lot of pressure on my shoulder and I got to make changes and my team doesn't appreciate it because I didn't spend the time in managing the, their expectation. I didn't sit down with Max and understood exactly what the problem was going to be for him, documented it, addressed it, and then addressed to other stakeholders. So spending the time to understand where people are coming from and trying to support them is going, is going to help you a lot. I know sometimes you might not have the time. Maybe you just identify the Kates of the world that are gonna love the software and try and get them to get other people to buy in. And some people, you're not gonna get them on board. And that's just the nature of the business, I think. And that, that's my perspective. Again, I'm not specialized in change management. I have run some. Um, I have been somewhat successful. I have failed many times as well. Does that? answer your question okay cool all right so so much for a practical workshop right so all of you are like oh great raf you showed a lot of cool stuff but what about the practical stuff so here is the meat and potato of this workshop and that's where i like to start it at the 30 minutes mark so 
this spreadsheet that I'm going to show to you has risk questionnaire, an impact matrix, probability matrix, and a risk registry. And the message that I try and include in every spreadsheet that I create for risk management is by understanding the risks our portfolio and projects face, we can be united on our effort to address these risks, right? Okay, now Raf, show us the meat and potato of that special spreadsheet. It's not that special, it's a normal spreadsheet. You might have a lot of risk management that looks exactly like this. So before I dive into this, I will stop here and say, can you see it okay? Like, is it the size is okay? Or, okay, got it, perfect. So this is a risk registry. And you see, you have many tabs at the bottom. We have the probability impact matrix. We have the probability and impact uh, grid from PM Bot. Um, are and you showing the spreadsheet? Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm not oh, seeing the spreadsheet. Oh, you're not seeing it. Huh. Yeah, we see a, yeah, a circle. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. so I, I know what I did. <laughs> I, instead of sharing the screen, yeah. I shared the... I thought maybe I was getting too old and I just don't see anything. <laughs> no, not at all. This, thank you. Thank you for providing the feedback on this because I was going to be here talking about the spreadsheet for 30 more minutes. <laughs> And nobody would be looking at it. it now. <laughs> All right. So this is the spreadsheet. And can you see it? Is it the size is okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. Looks good. So at the bottom, you have risk registry, probability matrix. They're just tabs, impact matrix, probability and impact matrix, and the risk questionnaire. But for now, we're going to focus in here. This is where the meat and potato of this is in the risk registry. Basic risk registry, you have your identifier, right? And in here, I'm going to have an explanation of what each of these things are for you. So the description, I have a little bit of an approach to the description. Normally, don't spend a lot of time here because you have your way of writing it and the workshop is only one hour. So we won't spend a lot of time there. But first one, identifier. It's just a number, right? Whatever your company is comfortable with. It's a letter, it's a number. It's just we know that this is risk number one. And it was actually Katie that brought it to the table she talked about it and date registered whenever that katie brought it up maybe it was in our risk meeting on april 11 2023 and actually we have to talk about categories as well right what are the categories of our risks what makes sense to this project what are the categories that we use for other projects uh, what yes. are the categories um, i just that picked up an hold? order and it wasn't what i ordered oh, and Rosa, i wanted sorry, to I talk about how to get this corrected uh oh, uh, Tanya, I think you might be. Do you need my check number or here. what I ordered? I'm not able to. My name is Rose. Rose, uh, we can hear you. Uh oh. That's a risk that we just happened. Yeah, a risk just happened. Uh, you right see? Now. That is it's a risk we I didn't talk her. about or set I any money I to you to mitigate. <laughs> we could have had many chicken Zoom meetings so we could join the other one. She Maybe. says, no, we can make them grill. Tanya, are I you said, that's great. The chat. I need you six. Might be able well, to originally I said them. I need six We tacos. can't hear you over And then over I the asked road. a chicken question. Yeah. And, and I the said I need uh, three grilled uh, and please? three beef. Uh, and I got six chicken. Rose, I got three grilled and three shredded. Rose, Rose, Rose. Hey, Rose, you're not on mute. Can you hear us? I am admiring her, her strong tone of voice when she's advocating for herself, though. And it sounds yeah. delicious. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Now I want tacos. <laughs> All right. I think, uh, Rose, you muted yourself. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. All right, perfect. Okay, back here, um, <laughs> risk description, <laughs> risk categories. So good, you always have to make sure you define, you talk about the categories. Remember, involve people so they learn, get them to be involved in definitional categories. I won't spend a lot of time here. You're gonna have to think about it on your own time for your own projects. Now, Raf, let's go. Probability, nice. It's a one, it's a two, it's a three. Oh, what's going on here? I don't know. Impact, it's a one. It's a two, I don't know, it's good. I understand that probability multiplied by impact turned into my risk rate. Great, then you have a, a rate, a number. But did you talk to your team about probability? Do they know what probability is? Here's my suggestion for you. You go to this tab, to the probability matrix, and you talk to them, see what makes sense to them. And you can start with a suggestion, say, hey, I believe that a five is almost certain that this is going to happen that we're gonna have a problem with this risk, that the risk that we talked about and we described, it's going to happen. 
And it's about a 91 to 100% uh, chance of this occurring. And if you want a little bit of a description, it's uh, expected to occur unless circumstances changes. So now you're talking, it's not a five. Now people know what it is, right? Maybe your executive and your people in your team are gonna wanna change this somehow, or maybe increase it to 10 rates instead of five. It's okay, let them collaborate. Even if you don't agree and they are providing you something that they want to collaborate, let them do it and do it for your risk because then it's more likely they are going to learn and feel part of it. Right now, one I know what one is. One is rare. It's very unlikely that this is going to happen. May occur only in exceptional circumstances. So it's less than five percent chance that this is going to occur. Now you're talking. Now you go back to your risk registry and say, okay, the probability of what uh, Kate raised here, which is uh, the hospital system failing in the go live date, so is actually a two because we did a lot of mitigation and it's a two but well what's two wait no we didn't talk about it oh let's go back two is five to 29 percent so 30 percent ish and it's unlikely but it could happen and could occur only if circumstances change so only if something that we didn't test something very crazy happens here then this is going to happen it's a two now, okay, we are aligned on that. Our team talked about it. They discussed, some disagreed, and you came up with what the probability is for that specific risk. But what is the impact, right? What is an impact? If, if it does happen, if the system goes belly up and now something is going on, what's the impact, right? Then you go to the tab number three in here, impact, and you talk about it with your team. Make it be whatever makes sense for you. But here's my suggestion. You can say that a five is very high. It's very high impact. You can say that it's going to impact maybe your budget. You say it's going to impact my budget 25% or more of my budget. My project budget is 500,000. It's going to impact 25% or more. Or if you're talking to your stakeholders and your sponsors, maybe it's the budget of the department that they want to use here, right? Whatever makes sense for them, not for you, for them so they can buy into this. You only be you're only going to be successful if they buy into this. So then the other suggestion here is what about the scope schedule and budget and quality? Maybe if it's a five, it's a significant and long-term impact on project scope, schedule, and or quality, right? So another suggestion that you can use as an impact. And then this is the major one that I like to use for all my portfolio. I have exactly same spreadsheet for a portfolio standpoint. We have a $125 million portfolio right now. And this is the table that I like to use and makes sense for us is prevent the achievement of one or more strategic directions and our portfolio goals, major impact on strategic and project goals, right? So very nice. Now you're talking about something that makes sense. Strong criticism by external stakeholders. So it's like, if this happens, the impact here is very high. Here's why. People are going to hate us forever, right? And <laughs> we're not going to get anything done anymore measure our long-term impact on internal or external stakeholder relationship, right? You cannot put a dollar value in relationships, especially with your customers. Even if it's internal customers, you're delivering projects internally. If you damage that relationship, it's very hard to put a dollar value into that. Maybe you're never going to get back to where you want it to be, right? It's a very high impact. Now, these are all suggestions. But if you were like a very low, I would say no impact from budget. If it's a very low and this risk occurs, no impact to my budget. Uh, virtually no impact on my ability to deliver within project scope, schedule, and budget and quality, and no impact on strategic directions in our project goals, rumors, or no internal or external stakeholder impact. So again, this is my lower spectrum here. Here is number one. It's a very low impact, right? So if we go back to the risk registry in here, we said it's a true probability but it's a hospital and things are going to be very bad. It's going to be very bad if this happens and if we don't have a mitigation, a fallback plan, or we don't have extra nurses, right? Depending on you, what is the situation? Have you done a mitigation? Have you put some stuff in place, right? You're going to come back in here. Remember, you're going to be monitoring your risks and updating them as you go. But let's say it's a five. So then what my calculator here does, it says two multiplied by five is a 10. Therefore, your risk rate for this is a 10. But if the probability was also high, number five, 
then you have a number of 25. The way I like to use this is some big projects, you get to have so many risks that sometimes I'm like, mm, I'm going to look at the red and yellows or just the red ones and the other ones we're going to keep on monitoring. Not the best approach in the world, but sometimes it's what it is, right? And what you can and cannot do. We did have a, another question that came oh, yeah, through on the chat. And this one is from Sharon. And it's just asking, what is the best time in the project lifecycle to fill out the risk log? And what do you do with the log after it's complete? And how often do you revisit the log? Very nice. I love that question. Here's what I, here's what I have done in the past. Um, I put the log together in the beginning of the project and we list a lot of risks. And I was like, yay, look at us. We manage risks. And then I forget about that. And then I come back when I close the project. That's not the right approach, but I have done that. I, and I'm, I, I have made that mistake uh, sometimes because I had too many projects on the go, sometimes because people didn't buy into my risk management or because I was not as passionate about getting people to buy into them. But that's not the right approach. And it happens to everybody, right? It's like, oh, man, I'm going to manage risk. No, it's OK. I'm feeling good about this project. The team is good. Let's not take their time and review risk. It's OK. Let's move forward. No, I don't, don't like that approach. So I would say you start with your charter in the initiation uh, with the risk and put them in there. If you can, and you're going to be using my template or your template, whatever you have, just put in the template there. Even if you don't have an impact and probability, that's okay. Just put the description in here, the time, who were the people, that the person that brought it to the table. Maybe it was you as the project manager, the date that you put it in there. It's okay. Just start using from the beginning. Now, in terms of how much cadence and, and continuous review that, that you do on this, I would say it depends on the project, but I recommend at least once every two weeks that you have a specific meeting to review the risks and talk about them, that you foster psychological safety so people can continue on bringing those things to you. And also throughout your project, every day, you remind them that there is a risk registry, right? Let's say I'm going here and then the metro says, hey, Raf, did you think about the, someone not unmuting themselves and, and talking during the meeting? Do you think about that? And this could happen in your project. And I was like, oh, actually, no, I didn't. Thank you so much. And actually, what I'm going to do, the metrics, if it's okay with you, I'm going to put this in the risk registry. And here's the link if you want to see all the other risks where I'm going to put your your what you brought up here. And then in my next meeting, which is going to be in two, two weeks from now or whatever the next meeting is, I'm going to address that. And, and we're going to talk about it as a team, see if it's, what's the impact, what's the probability, and maybe assign someone as a risk action here to help us uh, move this forward. So what you did just there is you got the metrics to see the value of risk management. You got the metrics to feel heard about your project. So now he's feeling a little bit more engaged and he knows that something is going to happen. And next time he can go to your risk registry and say, hey, Raf, I just thought about something else. Here you go. Do you want to, should we put that in the risk registry? I was like, no, yeah, this is good. Let's go and put it in there, right? So you created that awareness of how you're managing risks and you're getting everybody together as you address that. Does that, does that make sense? Answer the question, ish, ish. Okay, good. So now this is coming from Prince2, proximity. The first time I saw this on the Prince2 book talking about risk, I was like, what is this? What is a proximity? Why should I have this in my risk registry? And then I realized that this is actually beautiful because the proximity is, what's the distance? When, when is it this risk going to happen? Do we know? For the hospital, the hospital mig migration we're using here, I remember it was on a Monday that we did it. So I could say Monday, and let's say it's a Monday of whatever. No, I'll put a date in here, like Monday 11. So now you know that this risk you talked about during go live and your system failing, it's Monday 11. So the proximity here is Monday 11 when you're going to go live. That's when this risk could happen. You see how powerful this is. Now you can look at that and say, oh, I got to have a mitigation, a transfer. I got to have a fallback plan before Monday 11, because that's when this is going to happen. And of course, not all risks, you're going to be able to do this, right? You can't, like some risks are throughout the project. And, and then I have some suggestions in my note here is eminent within delivery. Uh, let me just go a little bit more there. Uh, within delivery, beyond projects, there are some risks that are going to happen even beyond projects, some suggestions. But the more specific you can be with your proximity, the better it's going to be and easier for you to manage this, right? So an example here, is what's the risk of Raf getting hit by a car? I was like, well, the proximity here is whenever he steps out of his house, but he works from home, he teaches from home, he almost never walks out of the house, he goes to the gym in the basement and he has a little gym. 
So yeah, I think today is not, but maybe on the weekend he's going to get out of the house. And I think the next time he's going to get out of the house is on Saturday. And that's not true because I'm flying tomorrow. So I'll get out of the house tomorrow morning. So that would be the proximity of me getting hit by a car, right? So then it helps us to look at that, engage that risk from a different perspective. It's not easy. I, I know my silly examples are easy, but it's not always easy to find a proximity uh, for your risk, but you got to have that discussion. Okay. Now, risk response. Again, this is where you're going to put your response, what type of response you're going to take. And, and I bring them back in here. So the mitigation, transfer, avoid. So you, you know this stuff and you're going to work on it and it's good. But what I want to bring to you is another thing here that comes from Prince 2, which is the risk owner. So Prince 2 has two roles in there, the risk owner and the risk action year. The way Prince 2 reads is says, risk owner is a named individual who is responsible for the management, monitoring, and control of all aspects of a particular risk assigned to them, including the implementation of a selected response to address the threat or maximize the opportunity. It's like, okay, I understand what an owner is, but what is the risk action year? And sometimes they are the same role. I would say separate them if you can. From a portfolio standpoint, what I do is I normally get myself as the risk owner, as the portfolio director, but I love to get action years. In a project, I would say get action years. So the person that is acting on that risk. So Prince Chu says action year is the risk action year, an individual assigned to carry out a risk response action or actions to respond to a particular risk, right? So on the hospital migration here that we talked about, I had a couple people that were the action year that needed to do each phase of our risk breakdown. So we had the guy that was responsible for flipping the system back. We had the person that was responsible to doing the communication in the hospital and saying, hey, the system is being fallen back. We gotta make sure that the extra nurses or the, the nurses that are in here for, for this can be engaged, that the healthcare practitioner can be engaged and the piece of papers have to be used and blah, 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 right? So we had a couple of people and here's the very important detail is, the risk action year has to be aware of this entire process and how their role is important. They have to understand what risk action they are taking and why, right? So this is very simple, but very important. Now, if you have never done this before and your company doesn't know what risk management is, maybe you start small. Maybe you start by including that on your charter and showing them why it's important. Maybe you talk about how assumptions that we make at the beginning can turn into risks as you dive into them. Right, start small, let them see the value, let them see how important it is, and then you grow big. Because if you start big and you sit in front of them and say, hey, here's a probability and an impact matrix, and you're like, what, what the heck are you talking about? Why is it important to me? I have so many more things that I gotta work on. Why are you doing this, right? So think about that and go slow. But if they are aware of the importance of it, Maybe you go a little bit faster. If it's a company you've been working for a long time, maybe you go a little bit faster and you understand your stakeholders and you're going to get buy-in. But don't give up. Don't, don't give up because all the projects that I ran, that I only put my risk register together, got feedback and never went back until the project closed. Uh, some projects were okay. Some projects could have been way better. And uh, if I had spent the time in thinking about my risks and thinking about the people that could help me be more successful by managing the risks and shaping the future. So I've got a question on terminology, you know, and this is, I guess, take this, I'll use a example. So for instance, if I'm a project manager and we're both going to a conference, but I've got stakeholders who are in the middle of testing. And even though I'll be away, there's three different developers that are, I guess where I'm going with this, like, I guess I would be a risk owner, like a risk would be okay if, the software is in testing during a particular milestone. There is a risk that they might find a bug or a defect, and it could impact one of these three areas. And my actioneer or actionee would depend upon what area the bug pops in on, if there's a bug. And they would be the actionee that I would send the email to, hey, this is what they found, resolve this. Is that kind of the context of risk owner 
Maybe you got it. You got it. But, but here's the challenge. Uh, you might not okay. know, and this is a very good uh, example because you might not know what that bug is going to be, right? It might be a development bug. It might be a design. It might be something that you need to, someone from a database. You might need someone from a network. You don't know. Then you got to make sure that you get the action here that will have the ability to action that. Even if the action is, oh, this is a bug, we really have to fix it. I know the people I got to contact. I'm going to go start with the instant manager here, and then we're going to dive into and maybe get the database people, right? So it gets too granular if you dive into that level of details, and then you might have an analysis by paralysis because you're breaking it down too much. Maybe you go one level up of someone that can take actions and in, in managing that risk for you. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, I guess, <laughs> I guess in this instance, I've communicated to them, this is a risk for all of their different areas. So three of them worked on different pieces and just, I will monitor the emails and depending upon a circumstance, if it's communicated, it will go to the team and they know who worked on what. So, okay. That helps. Very nice. Love it. All right, so I have a couple more tabs here in my spreadsheet and we have a couple more minutes to go. So we're very good in time. On the probability impact matrix, you probably have seen this before. It's coming from PM Block and I, they made some little changes in here to what I thought made sense. Um, but basically on the left side, you have your threats, right? So what my calculation is doing is basically saying, is it a very low from a probability? Is it very low from an impact? Is it high? So if it's a low probability, high impact, it's a number five, right? It's just a little matrix so people can look at this and say, oh, that's how you do the calculation. That's why we get the risk rating of 15, 25, and et cetera. And that also applies to opportunities, right? On the opportunity here, is it a high probability that this opportunity is going to happen? All right, but is it a high, very high impact? We're actually going to get lots of return here, or is it moderate or is it low right so just a little table that you can refer to um, and maybe use as you explain and talk about this with your team and lastly in the risk questionnaire it's just a couple questions in here that is actually coming from the um, ba box the business analysis uh, body of knowledge so the uh, iiba is another institution that governs the business analysis best practice and in their P uh, ba box the business analysis body of Book of, book of knowledge. They have a couple of questions. They have some approach to a lot of things, but I, I just copied their questions on risk management and I put it in here because I, I thought they made sense. They are simple enough, but they can help you drive your first risk management meeting is, are there any threats that could have a negative impact on the overall health of your portfolio or projects? Are there any desirable events, opportunities that would have a positive impact? And then they dive into three specific questions. What is the likelihood of if, if it occurs? What is the impact on the business if it occurs? And what is the best strategy for dealing with this risk, right? And keep on asking those questions in different ways and making sure that people feel empowered to collaborate, that th this project is not only yours as the project manager, but it's ours. It's also theirs. The, the success are going to be theirs and the mistakes and problems that happens are gonna be on you, project manager. Right, that that's how we should do it. Right, <laughs> that's that's how I think we should do it. Is any mistakes we have, we bring it to our shoulders, and we do it as project managers. And any good things that happens, the way people see your project and the success you get, I would go and give it to your team because they were very good collaborating to this. Anyway, that's just one thing that I like to think about. But now let me go back to my little presentation in here. And we are almost at the finishing line. We're going to have 10 more minutes uh, to go, maybe a couple minutes for questions. But if you do really do want to get access to this and you like the presentation, then I just ask that you do uh, three things for me. As connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I know a lot of people in the past, they have sent me in a message on LinkedIn and they have to use their LinkedIn Prime account. You don't have to. If you're not my connection, just connect with me. And after I accept it, I'm going to accept everybody probably by tonight or whenever you send the link to me. Then you just have to tell me two things. What did you like the most about this presentation? And then what do you think I could improve? Right. So just tell me those two things on LinkedIn and I'm going to get the spreadsheet to you um, and you are welcome to use it, to share, to do whatever you want. But I always like to get feedback and improve this approach and 
make our lives better as project managers. So this is this is it. This is what I wanted to share with you. We have 10 minutes to go so we can open for questions, concerns, anything. I am going to open it to the floor for people to ask questions, and then I will repeat the claim code in a little bit for the PDUs for guests. I have a question here. Uh, Rafael, that was a pretty good uh, presentation. Thank you very much. But the, uh, you know, now with uh, chat GPT, how, how are you going to use this to integrate with uh, what you're doing, you know, like, I'm doing a presentation inside my company about how we use ChatGPT to enhance our project program management skills. And I'm finding out there's all kinds of stuff you can do, you know, like scheduling and and uh, a bunch of different things. And uh, risk management is one of them. So what's your idea or your first uh, thing about ChatGPT for it? I love this question. I, I this is this is brilliant. And here's I'll give you an example. Tell me what your project is about. One of the projects uh, you're one working on. One thing, on. by the way, that I learned today, just just uh, warning for everybody. Even so, ChatGPT can find code, can find bugs, and correct your code. Don't fill in your code, or it will learn from it, and then proprietary code can be used for other people too. So, uh, yes. So my thing is like. How can I be sure that my developers are not using uh, ChatGPT to debug their code so mm. they don't give up our our trade secrets? Oh, I see. Okay, so I was going in a completely different direction. I was going to show you how you could use ChatGPT to find some risk. So, so basically what I was going to show here, and I won't this time, is you can get any project you want. Like say you're working on a healthcare project system migration. You can go to ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm working on a healthcare system project. And what are the risks that you believe uh, I could be considering? And then ChatGPT would tell you a bunch of risks. And you can say, can you please expand more on those risks? Kind of help you start that initial project charter. ChatGPT could help you. And I have done that before for many other projects. Now, your question is more specifically on a security, uh, information security approach. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm talking about that can be can be fed to the ChatGPT and see what happened. I was I'm hoping you use that as an example. Yeah, So, so here, okay. So I'll go back there uh, to what I had. So I just typed in here again, just open ChatGPT. I don't know if it's going to give me a lot, but it might. What is the risks I could face on a system hospital migration from a project management standpoint? Uh, come on, project management standpoint. So then boom. Okay, chat GPT, see if, oh, there are several risks. So one, schedule delay, system migration, like complex projects that involve multiple stakeholders, budget overruns, data loss of corruption, system downtime, uh, resistancy to change. Uh, so hospital staff may be resistant to change. Beautiful, I, I had that in my risk for sure. And we didn't even have chat GPT at the time. Security breaches, so system migration involved the transfer of sensitive uh, patient data, and it is not uh, properly secured. This data could be that vulnerable to security breaches. So you see, now this is me, didn't even talk to the team, just came in here and asked ChatGPT and ChatGPT is giving me some inputs, right? I can say, can you elaborate? And then ChatGPT just go, sure. Here are some additional details about the risks I mentioned about, right? Schedule delays and then dive into them a little bit. So beautiful, here you're using the technology to help you manage your projects. I use ChatGPT almost on a daily basis. I don't give it any information that is about my customers, my client, my company, but I use it to provide me feedback and give me information. Now, if Ron, your question was more about the uh, security. So if my developers get the code, the code that we develop internally that is not open source and put in ChatGPT and ChatGPT ingest that data and now ChatGPT has that data, that's a big risk. Um, I don't know exactly how people can mitigate this, uh, especially in my company, we have open communication or people are allowed to use it, but they cannot put any company sensitive data as any other place, right? So you wouldn't upload on your personal drive company data information about the company and stuff like that. So I, I think starting with the people here and then making sure there's processes in place that uh, don't don't let people do that. And maybe systems, a security robust system that would 
hold you back from doing so. I don't think there's any system out there that would hold you back from putting data in chat GPT as of today. Another thing is what some universities are doing is they're blocking chat GPT completely and say, you're not allowed to use it. And in my network, you don't use it. If you log into my VPN, you don't use chat GPT, it's blocked. I think it's uh, one step too far because chat GPT helps me today and my project managers almost on a daily basis. But you can run chat GPT on your, on your phone now. You, you can on your personal laptop. So they cannot be blocked anymore. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's that's just mind boggling, right? The the companies are blocking it, but then you have your phone that you could use it. It's yeah, I think it's here to stay. It's here to help us be better, be more Do you human. think it will replace the project management? Not at all. Not at all. It's gonna give the project manager more more time to be more strategic, to be more humane. It's gonna help. It's gonna help us be more creative but it's not going to replace us, I don't think. And that's just me again, I could be completely wrong. There's actually a question that came through, but before I get to that right quick, I wanted to share the claim code for guests of the chapter tonight. I know I shared it in the chat, which this recording will be available on our website at www.pmibatonrouge.org within a couple of days. But the claim code for those of you that are guests of the chapter and have the credentials is C106P1Z4RZ. Can you type it, please? I did, but I will type it again. Um, and there is a question. Let's see, there's several questions coming through. Uh, this one from a shocky. If an organization is new to risk management, what elements of this spreadsheet have you found is easier to adopt first? Very nice. So I would say you forget about the impact. You forget about everything. You just document the risk. Just start listing them. Maybe you don't even use the spreadsheet to start. You start listing the risks and talking about them. I would say go from there and then you can start using more of the spreadsheet. But when I do use it, it's the spreadsheet with all the elements in it. I think they help you, but you got to get people to buy into why risks are important. Start talking about it adding it to project, to your project charter, to your project, project plan and talk about it. Like the more you talk, the more you get people to buy into it, the better you're going to be, right? You have a lot of top stakeholders that don't listen to project managers, learn who are the people that they listen to, get those people to buy into your risk, get those people to appreciate project management. They are gonna convince that top stakeholder that doesn't li listen to PMs. That's, that's what I, I think works. And then just a couple more. Now I know that we're we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, Raphael, do you have a few more minutes for a few other questions? Or I do. I got a pack to uh, leave very early tomorrow morning. I know. It's, uh, Eight p.m. <laughs> my time, <laughs> but I do have maybe ten more minutes. It would would be okay. Okay, that's fair. Same here. So, all right. Let's see. Okay, from Isaiah, it's how do you suggest to use these effectively in an agile environment? Very nice. In my head, oh, here's two things about Agile that I like to share. And every question I answer, and maybe it's the Brazilian nature in me. Uh, we we talk around stuff and we don't, like, we're not too specific. That was something I had to improve <laughs> to fit into the Canadian market was uh, be more specific. But anyway, the two things I like to think about Agile. The first one is Agile is a big thing. I think Agile is like Home Depot, right? Home Depot, you walked into Home Depot, that's Agile. And then the different departments within Home Depot, they are like Scrum, XP, they're like different types of Agile. And maybe Scrum is a department where you have a lot of people in there. It's like you enter into Agile and there's a Scrum in here and people are doing Scrum and a lot of people are buying stuff from there. And that's where most people are, it's the Scrum. I was like, oh, great, okay. So Home Depot's the entire Agile here, the mindset, the, the Agile manifesto that was written in 2001, more than, 20 years ago, and we think it's a new thing, but it's 20 years ago they were talking about, okay, great. Now, how do we apply this to risk management? I see Agile as small interactions, but you can also manage risk. There are a specific approach to software, man, uh, to software development that you can use, but in an Agile environment, I think you can still use this spreadsheet here. You can still be consistent enough and embrace uh, people 
over documentation. So you're going to talk and collaborate with people over having a lot of documentation. Doesn't mean you don't have documentation, right? It's like, okay, it's uh, people over uh, documentation, a uh, process over collaboration. It's like, okay, great. So there's no documentation. No, it's not that. You have to document it. I would say you can use the same thing and maybe break it down into specific approaches per week and still go back to managing your risks. Like I think Tanya talked about here is her software development project that she's working on and they are testing it and they have risks and those risks have to be documented and you got to make sure that people understand what they are. So I would say, take the same approach, do the same thing, right? And I believe it's going to work. I have used this exactly risk matrix in other projects in the province of Manitoba when I was working for them. And we, we had a purely agile, or actually it was a hybrid, uh, approach and we were using this risk matrix. So I think it's going to work for Agile as well. And I have done that in the past. Okay. I'm going through and I think that's actually, that actually wraps most of the questions. So I did just want to reiterate to the people on the phone and, and Raphael put this information out here as well, that he'll share these different tools with everybody. If you connect with him on LinkedIn, which he's put his information and also that's the information on his LinkedIn and how to contact him went out through our communications as well. So connect with him and he will get you all those tools. And on our chapter, I did want to announce that next week we're having our in-person meeting. This one's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be on Thursday, April 20th at Oxbow Distillery on St. Philip Street in Baton Rouge. It's a little bit of a networking social, and we're also going to be having tours there. So the tours are going to be organized in groups of 15 at a time. And then we're going to have an outside venue where everybody can visit and chat. It does include tasting, and we're going to be bringing in food for that. So y'all should have gotten at least the first communication on that, and that's on our website as well. And then our next virtual meeting is slated for May 9th working on getting a little bit more information about the speakers. So hopefully we will have that in the system soon and on our website. But wanted to take the opportunity to say thank y'all for all of you for coming tonight as well. And I wanted to say thank you to Raphael. I, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to present to us and educate us as well. And you know, to all of you, hope to see you in person. And for those of you that are able to join us virtually, hope that we get to see you next month as well. So. How are you going? I'm looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Thank you. all Bye. Thank you. Bye.